Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Okay, so what I really wanted to do, I, I want to do some follow up first, but I, I want to talk about what the main topic is and then back up a little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, I was going through and you can see, like, I have all these plans for other topics and stuff, and I kind of wanted to cover this because we've covered food delivery and its, its impact on a whole bunch of different things. And I just kind of wanted to cover it at the end. It's kind of like it's a big, you know, that's a big surprise kind of sarcastic thing that Sprig went out of business and shut mm. down. And then I realized as I was making notes, this is like a topic to cover. It's back. It's back. And I think we're going to find out that over time, we're just going to keep coming over and over again yeah. to a bunch of different topics. So I wanted to talk about this. Um, and then we'll talk about some other stuff kind of at the end. But basically what happened was I was looking over and over and over this topic. And I thought, you know what? This is not something to cover at the end. This is mm. something to cover now. It's not so going away, is it? It's not going to go away. And I think that's the key point is that, you know, if you look at the notes, it's like this fight – is not over, mm -hmm. but the quest isn't over either. Like people really want to get this right. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about. I have a little bit of a progression that I want to work on. Right. So, Sprig is a company that I've been following for a while, and a couple of days ago, it this on-demand food startup just said it's shutting down. Now I know that this is not in Asia, in general. It's not in Southeast Asia specifically, but I think we used to say, and I still believe to a certain extent this is true that we can see the future here because we watch what's going on in the United States, which is your most well-developed um, you know, startup market and best funded market. And I think this spring shutdown is actually a really important development in this whole kind of food delivery market. And let's leave the sort of supermarket food stuff for another conversation because I think it's very different. But what Sprig was trying to do was really kind of automate this whole concept of we know that people are going to want to have food quickly. Let's find a way to prepare like five or six separate meals and then we'll get it to them in 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, they had its own, they had their own kitchens, which was something that you and I had spoken about before they were delivering their own food, right? So they wanted to eliminate this thing. I believe about going to like individual restaurants, they wanted to have their own food and that was going to make them more efficient, make their unit economics better. They want to control the whole chain, right? Mm -hmm. It still didn't work. Fifty-seven right? so million of funding, and a good yeah, founder so I to, as well. I mean, I, I uh, found yes, a lot of good so, things about him, right? Yes, yeah, so that's the thing I want to talk about, right? So this guy Gagan Biani, very famous actually, um, and this is not like the first time he's done something. And one of the reasons why he got funded, right, was you know because he's done other things, right. And this money that he raised from Greylock and Social Capital was raised because of some of the other stuff he's done before. And it means that the founding team was amazing. Like you said, they raised almost $57 million in what, a few rounds of funding, yeah? I think it was four rounds of funding. And if you go and look at who, the, who funded this company, Great Oaks Venture Capital, the seed stuff they probably did themselves, Back in 2013, later they raised a little bit more money. And then Social Capital and Greylock, these are like real bona fide venture capitalists. Mm -hmm. They should like they should know, right? Mm -hmm. And yet they went out and took a risk on him um, because of his previous successes. The key to me here is that even with a superior team, and this team was superior, um, a new idea, so a new approach to the way the food delivery was going to work, right? And as I said earlier, it's not like going to a restaurant and picking stuff up. They have their own meals. You know, they probably wanted it to be super healthy and stuff, and they wanted to have 15-minute delivery. So they were trying to innovate at, at every point in the, in the chain. It still didn't work, hmm. right? And they were also focusing just on big cities, so like San Francisco, Chicago, places where, you know, there's a heavy concentration of people that would use the service and they just shut it down. So what is the what is the point, right? What does that mean for the rest of the chain? Well, a year ago, almost exactly a year ago, there were a bunch of sort of breathless articles about how this market, not just in Southeast Asia, but in all of Asia, was heating up, right? The whole concept of delivery, whether it was Food Panda or Tin Men or all these other companies 
we were going to come and kind of follow what was going on in the United States and re, you know, rejigger the way this market was. Now, we also know, right, let's go back to the U.S., Spoon Rocket, which was also super well-funded, right, mm. $13.5 million. Um, DoorDash, how much money did they raise? Well, they're still around, but they raised just under $190 million, right? $190 million, right? So what does that mean for all these business models out here? Yeah. So what do you think is driving some of this, right? It's just from a business model perspective, because my, I think the point that I'm trying to make here, right, is that this market is large, mm. but it needs a better and more efficient business model. I want to get to, I want to get to what Alibaba has done recently right. in China. And I want to also get to what happened in Hong Kong with the kind of healthy, because I think these are, this is a niche business, right? The healthy meal delivery stuff. There are like 10 or 15 businesses in Hong Kong that are trying to attack this. Because I have a view, and we'll talk about this too later. I'm not saying these aren't good businesses. I just wonder at some level if they're fundable businesses and scalable businesses, right? Mm. So I was talking to somebody about this today and yesterday. You can build a business in a bunch of different sectors, right? Where there's $8 million of revenue, you've got a 20 to 25% margin, and you make $2 million. And as a founder, that's a lot of money, right? So if someone gives you $2 million a year, you can live on that in a way that's really nice, no matter where you're living. But is that a fundable business? I don't know. Anyway, let's go back to some of these details and, and talk about it, right? So I think that um, we don't know yet what this business model is, but it needs to be more efficient. It needs to be better. Let's go over some of the data again, right, and some of the business models, right? There is kind of an aversion from people to pay for delivery. Right. This is the problem, right? It's a huge problem, that's, that's right? It's a so, fundamental problem that the math doesn't stack up whether or not they get funding. Right. The unit economics don't seem to work for me, Right. And yes, and I was talking to somebody else about this today too. So what does what does DoorDash do? Right, right. They'll take an existing um, restaurant's menu, and they'll just add a fee on top of it. Yeah. So 20%. they say delivery is free. Yeah, but they yeah. charge twenty percent. That's a lot, right? Right. Without telling the customer, the customer thinks they're paying for what they would pay at the the door, right? For the if they go to the restaurant itself, but they're not. They're getting marked up twenty percent. Right. And what's the likelihood of somebody like sitting at home, yeah. you know, with their wife or their girlfriend or their partner or whatever it is and say, hey, hon, um, if we go to the restaurant, here's the offline menu, which is a dollar. And here's the online menu, which is a dollar twenty. We're getting ripped off because they say the delivery is free. Mm. So what's the fee for? Right. And yeah, sure. The founder of the company is always going to say, you know, we're just doing that so that people don't feel like they're getting ripped off or there's some kind right. of sticker shock or whatever you want to call it, right? But it's dishonest. I mean, it's a problem, isn't it? I mean, it shows that they can't charge what they need to charge to make the model work. They can't be honest with the customer. I mean, you know, if you go to Amazon and buy a product off Amazon, you pay what you get, right? You know, and that, there's no dishonesty there, right? So they can charge you what that person thinks they can pay for it, right? But in this model... They're having a problem charging what they need to make to make it economically viable, right? And if the customer right. doesn't agree with that model, there's a fundamental problem with the model, right? Right. And what is, like, there's a term for that. It's, right, negative gross margins, right? So you sit in a business, and I've talked about other businesses like this, right? So look at ClassPass. I know it seems completely unrelated, but look at ClassPass in the United States, right? You charge 100 and something dollars a month for people to have any kind of class they want. It's the same type of thing. It's negative gross margins. And the idea is let's get as many people on the platform as we possibly can. And then either A, we'll increase fees or we'll add other services, right? Yeah, yeah. Again, it doesn't seem to work. And we can talk later about a different business model that may be able to justify this, but I don't think it does, right? And okay, so DoorDash can say that other companies charge a flat fee on top of the delivery and a, and a comm, right? And, and, and you'd be surprised. You know, I know because I've spoken to the guys that – Ginja here, right? I know them very well. They're trying to do something slightly different, which we can talk about later, but under separate cover, yeah? But some of these services, whether it's Food Panda or whatever, they charge as high as 30% on top of on yeah. top of what the regular price is going to be. I don't know. I just don't see that working at any level. 
Right. Well, you've got this Yelp company as well taking the driver's tips. I mean, there was a big fuss about that recently, right? It just goes to show that they're scratching around for, for margins, right? If they're having to take the tips from the drivers. Right. So, but what does that tell you about the business model? Yeah. It's just, I, you know, we've talked about this before, but this is the perfect example of something actually who's super well funded and a great team and they just cannot find a business model that works right. even though they tried to iterate around it right and yeah you cannot be taking your driver's tips it just doesn't work what did you think of that data from doordash i know i mean this is not asia but it's relevant to what we're talking about here but they're spending 200 dollars recruiting every driver and the drivers stick around for an average three to six months with the company right, right? right. I mean, what are your thoughts so, when you see that kind of model well, two problems. One is that a lot of online businesses have this problem of customer churn, right? In other words, if there's no differentiating factor between what DoorDash does and you know what all the other delivery companies, remember Uber is already in this business, Uber Eats, right? So what's the difference between what they do and what's the stickiness of that product, right? It's very low. And what that means is that customer churn is really high and that the customers will also go to different places. I'll get to this in a second, right? But now DoorDash has a problem, and I think other companies have the same problem, of employee churn, hmm. right? So not only are they having a cost of customer acquisition problem, but a cost of employee acquisition problem, right? You see this, again, in slightly in other businesses, right? Are you driving for Uber? Are you driving for Lyft? Or in Asia, are you driving for Grab? And you can make a determination, and you can keep rotating around whoever offers you the best deal, but again, from a customer service perspective, it's terrible. Mm. But also from a business perspective, if DoorDash is paying $200, that's, that means they're replacing their team every three to six months. And you're right. If they've got $25,000, that's $5 million every few months, every few months, excuse me, just to get their drivers and delivery people on the road. Right. Right, and that doesn't include any. That doesn't include the money that they actually pay their drivers exactly. to do their job. Yeah, exactly. And the money they're going to lose from the poor service, and something we talked about before, like here in Japan, where you've got the Yamato guy who has like, no. been working twenty years in the same truck in the same two streets. You know, the reason he can get you that packet at that time at six o'clock in the evening is because he knows exactly what house it needs to go to. And, you know, he knows who he's going to deliver it to, right? But if you've got a new guy who's delivering a pizza, wow. You know, he's, he's the sort of the brand experience that that customer gets when he turns up at the door or not turns up at the door, right? So that's a real problem, right? Right. I mean, one of the things that the logistics companies in Japan have really nailed is that, you know, you just have your one square block of service. That guy knows you inside and out. He knows when you're home. He knows when you're not home. You know, he trusts you so much that sometimes even if you can't pay, he'll just yeah. come back later. Yeah. Right? He will. I mean, it's happened. we've yeah. talked about this. It's happened to me. I know it's happened to you. He's like, yeah, it doesn't matter. Here's your package. We'll come back. Right? And you know, they leave, still leave those stickers on your door that say, like, we were here. When you Please let me know when you're going to be home and I'll come back later. That type, that type of service is really important. And if it's not happening for the food delivery it's just really, I mean, DoorDash does more than just food. But if they're not doing it for that type of business, like they're just going to lose you. Right. Well, you because can't build a business on that, can you? You can't get traction well, with the cut. You can't get repeat business. That's the problem, isn't it? Because these are the people that, you know, they spend all this money advertising. But if the guy that turns up or doesn't turn up to your door is going to impact your business, well, that could affect everything, right? Right, and we'll talk about it a little bit later. So if you look at this article in Tech in Asia about what's happening in the Chinese business, right, the ELE.me business, all food delivery, we'll get to that in a bit. But these guys are like all dressed up in very fancy uniforms with fancy helmets on. But the idea for me is that, you know, once that guy shows up in like dirty clothes, and mm -hmm. I've seen it here and I've seen it everywhere, actually, you're just going to lose it. Because if somebody who's not very clean is delivering food, you're just never going to order that again because it feels like that dirtiness is getting, at least for me, is getting transferred to your food. Mm -hmm. and it just feels like that's not going to work. And he has to turn up as well. I mean, that must be a major problem for new guys. You know, they're in areas yeah. they don't know, right? And in some of these cities, I mean, it's not like, you know, you would expect where you have zip codes and what you'd expect in the U.S. You know, if you go to Jakarta, for example, <laughs> you're, you're out there in the wild, aren't you? 
I don't remember if you and I were having this conversation, if it was with somebody else, but like I was talking to my brother last week, right? We were just chatting back and forth and I was thinking about addresses, right? So I went and see, I wanted to see if I had my brother's address and I won't say it because my brother's, he does a certain job that people don't know his home address, but regardless, his address is just like a number, yeah. a street name and a town, right? And there are like 10 houses on his street. And they're separated by enough land that, like, you can't really make a mistake. And it probably says, you know, the number one on his mailbox or whatever his address is. So when someone shows up to deliver stuff to his house, it's pretty, it's pretty obvious who it is. Was it you? I can't remember. But when I lived in Japan, my address was, like, Minami Aoyama 4-5-18. And that was also the address of the house next to mine. Right. That's the block sometimes, right? <laughs> Well, yeah, because the because that address was a remnant of the old address that used to be for that whole block of land, which then got yeah. subdivided. Yeah. So when the Yamato guy showed up, like he knew who I was because I had my name on my front door. But if I didn't have it, or if you couldn't read English, which I had never really thought about, because my name was written W A I T Z E on my front door, right? Mm. And that was really the only distinguishing factor between my address and the guy next to me, whose name was like Hashimoto. I can't remember. What name was but you know you understand what i mean right yeah so yeah you're right in a place where the addresses are not like really straightforward uh, i don't know how people are going to get this done now we should also talk about like this concept of automated delivery right where oh, the yeah. person who shows up isn't actually a person yeah like do you have a do you have a view on this for food well, well there's been a few tests haven't there there's Recently, we've got the, uh, I mean, Yelp have been doing this with uh, those delivery delivery robots. I don't know if they're actually operational yet, but they've been testing them in San Francisco, which is kind of interesting. So they're out there. But, you know, I don't think Yelp really, or Eat24 are the big players in this. It's going to be the Ubers and the Amazons if they were to get into this space. I mean, Uber particularly. I mean, I've seen articles written about the Uber Death Star. <laughs> it's a love, fantastic uh, summary, right? <laughs> you know, what if Uber was to turn their whole delivery business into automated bots, right? I, I think we're, I mean, I saw some Travis Kalanick saying 2030. So, I mean, it's a way off, right? In terms of, the, you know, they've got a very long-term plan for this. But it, it makes you wonder, isn't it? I mean, if you're sort of backing a food delivery startup and these guys were to get into the business with automated food delivery you really only have a, a window of 10 years right as a business to to be able to prove yourself to get to their kind of level before they get in the game but they're going to get in the game a lot earlier so i don't know it doesn't signal well for anybody who's in the market what do you think yeah, i mean i don't know I'm, i mean i kind of have a different view on this which is actually good for both of us right but my view on this is that there's a lot of stuff that can be automated. Like I think you can actually automate the delivery of a book or a package or, you know, a cell phone. Like if I ordered the newest cell phone, I don't really have too many questions about it. It doesn't have to come hot or cold. It can be 10 minutes late and it's not going to change my appreciation of that device. Yeah. But like a pizza, what if it's what if, and I don't think this happens so infrequently that it doesn't matter, but like what if the pizza comes cold? Like, what if the guy gets, what if the machine breaks down? Right. You know what I mean? Like, if, it, if it's an elect, electric vehicle, because you can't fill these things up with gasoline, right? Or kerosene or who knows what the, the, you know, the next thing is. But if it's an electric vehicle, sure, it may know my address, but what if it breaks down? And these things are small, right? And I was thinking about this a couple of days ago. What if someone just lifts it? Hijacks it, yeah, in the back. Do you know, do you know <laughs> what I mean? Like, what if someone gets small? <laughs> Right. You get two guys or two gals, like they just go, oh my God, that's E24. It's got Yelp on it. It's got to have food in it if it's coming around. There's our pizza. Well, let's just take it because if you, I mean, everything is hackable, right? Right. Whether it's physically hackable or software hackable. And I just watch this thing and I'm like, someone's going to lift it. Right. But can you, can you lay all those arguments at human delivery drivers as well? I mean, you know, we, we had that conversation about yeah, autonomous yeah, yeah. vehicles, and it turns out that autonomous vehicles were safer than you know human driver you could argue the same things right you know you've got the guy who's who doesn't give a crap about his job and he's just you know he's skiving off somewhere in the back in the you know with the pizza that's going cold can't be bothered to deliver it those kind of scenarios right could do but but like and yeah you could kidnap the guy that's doing it 
but these machines like have no emo- they have no nothing right they have no emotion no nothing and i get the fact that they're probably like more secure than like a maximum security prison so you can't get your pizza out of it but what if either a someone lifts it so they just take it away second there's no defense against it, right? It's not like the thing can spray you with mace or do anything bad to you. It has no, like, self-defense. Whereas a not guy... <laughs> yeah, maybe. But a guy can, like, fight... Well, remember, you can't have self-defense on it. So, like, the... Whatever the the the, um, the regulatory entity is that, that regulates this stuff says, like, even a drone that's flying a package to your house cannot have a gun on it or something to defend itself because it could go rogue. Like, you just don't know. Yeah. But but like someone could just lift this thing and, and just like steal your food. Or let's say it shows up to your door. Right, watch this. Pizza shows up, it's raining outside, right? And it's gonna rain. And guy shows up from Domino's or wherever, has a pizza, and you're like, look, it's the cheese is like stuck to the top and I'm just not paying for this. Mm. And there's probably some policy that they have that says, you know what, never mind. I'll be back in thirty minutes, your pizza's free, I'll get you a better one. No problem. It's not even a long conversation because, again, this is just cost of acquisition. These big companies know what the deal is with that. But if this drone thing shows up, you can't talk to it, right? You can't reason with it. This is the reason why. Well, I don't want to talk about this online, but <laughs> you can't reason with it. <laughs> I don't want to mention dogs or cats because people will get mad at me. But you can't reason with it. You can't like negotiate with it. You can't maybe send it back, or maybe you can through like some kind of program, but. What if the doors don't open? Hmm. What if it malfunctions? I, I don't know. Like, I, I, I listen to the conversations that you know Jason Calacanis has about, like, not UberX, but CafeX, which makes coffee for you. Mm-hmm. It's just an automated coffee machine. And if you don't show up and it's made your coffee, it'll throw that one away and make you another one. Like, if you were late or you got stuck in traffic. But it won't let you do it forever. Mm-hmm. Like, if you do it three times, it just shuts you down or some such policy. But what happens in reverse if this thing shows up at your door and you just can't get it open? There's no one to argue with. You can't negotiate. I think people, here's what I really believe about this is, I think there are certain things that can get automated. But you know this from calling your bank or your credit card company, right? Press one for English, press Mm -hmm. two for Japanese, press three for Spanish. You're like, I just want to talk to somebody. Please, like this is really simple. I don't want to go through menus. I just want to know which, like, which thing do I do? But do you want to talk to a food delivery drive? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I just want the guy to hand over the food and be gone, right? I mean, yeah, maybe, I maybe that's me, but I think you can I don't want to talk that, to him. Right? You, yeah, but I, I don't know because there's never, like, there's always a problem. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's not a mood I'm in. Like, there's always some kind of thing where it's like, you know, you said you'd be here by 6.30 and you're not, so I get it for free, right? Right. But you can't argue with them. You can't argue with this machine. It's like, no, nope, I got a timestamp. And you're like, yeah, but your timestamp was different than mine. I just see real problems with automating this delivery. And I think, I believe really strongly that humans want to interact with other humans. Right? We, we can. There's a whole different conversation about how salespeople are going to be replaced by machines and all this other stuff. I think there's a great and massive market, and we know this already, for machines that make other things. But I really believe that people, humans want to interact with other humans. And you're right, yeah? You say, I want the guy to show up at my door, I want him to give me my pizza and just leave. And that's true, right? But don't you want that guy to smile? And won't you order again from the guy that smiles as opposed to the person who comes and just have, what do they call it, the RBF, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> You know what that stands for, yeah? Mm-hmm. You do, yeah. So what? I don't want that. What are you talking about? Rest, resting, resting. Oh, bitchy defense. face. <laughs> yeah, the RBF. Like you want someone who's smiling and happy, and that person right. has. They're gonna sell you something next. I'm not bothered by that, but believe it's me. You know, I, I believe in human to human service. You know, if I walk into a store, but when it comes to logistics like this. You know, I just want them to hand it over, right? You know, I'm the kind of person that phones up. You know, I'd rather order food via a smartphone. I'm the kind of person that doesn't want to phone up and actually speak to a human being at the end of it, right? I'm shocked. I'm that kind of person. 
Wow, I'm shocked. You know, it's like it's like such an inconvenience to have to speak to somebody and order on the phone, right? I would go out of my way to do it online. Don't but I'm make happy me talk to, walk to another into a human. Store, right? Yeah, I mean, I've got a Starbucks because I can speak to a barista there and they know my name. I like all that. But oh, wow. I'm completely opposite there. Like, wow. and, and this is interesting to me. Like, I, this Cafe X thing really interests me. Completely different topic, but it really interests me because I just want to be able to press a button and have a double shot soy cappuccino. I want to get the same thing every time, and I don't want to talk to anybody about it. I really just want to show up, and I don't want them to spell my name M I C H E A L E A L on the side of it. Like, do you know anybody else named Michael? It's the most common male name in the world. Please just don't even write my name on the thing and just give me my coffee. Right, but that's in your office or at home, right? Or No, that's in the real world. Right. If I could walk into – because I have – not stress, but like I have stress around walking into like Starbucks anywhere in the world and saying I want a double short, double soy, lat soy latte or soy cappuccino. And they're like, you want the middle size? I'm like, no, no. I just want two shots in the smallest thing with the least amount of milk I can get. I've tested this everywhere. That, that's what I want. You need and like I a always... printed card. <laughs> yeah, I do. Just hand it over. Just like a punch card from the 70s. Yeah. I want it to be like in Fortran so I can just like put it into a thing and have it come out with my thing. There you go. But for a delivery guy, I want it to be like nice. Well. Anyway, I'm not convinced that food delivery is going to be done by machines. Right. Well, the margins are too small anyway, right? I mean, that's the problem. Who's going to have the money to invest in this and make it work when you're making pennies on the dollar, right? Yeah, agreed, right? And we, so, again, let's get back to this, but like the Uber Death Star, right? I guess, I don't know, maybe they'll replace it with robots. I'm just not a big fan of that, right? right? But well, doesn't that go back I, to your point? I mean, you were quite bullish on this last week, or I think the week before when we were talking about these models where, you know, there could be a laundry business delivering to your home. The point is they're not making money on the laundry. They're making money out of knowing exactly, you know, what kind of clothes you have, your kind of habits, all those kind of things, right? You've got right. That, so, that billing relationship with the home. Right, so good point, right? So I, again, we talked about, you know, I kind of misunderstood maybe at some level the shopping for groceries, which we're not talking about today, and the shopping for food, right? The dry cleaning stuff, because they create so much data. They know where you live. They know how you pay. They know what you wear. They know how often you change your clothes. We talked about that. But the problem with this business from food delivery is, you're not going to order out on a regular basis, depending on where you live in the world, right? Mm -hmm. And particularly in Thailand and probably the same thing in Indonesia and in Vietnam, where food itself is so cheap. Yeah, exactly. And it's so available, right, that the margin there can just cannot be big enough to justify it. I can literally go out on the street around the corner from where I live and I can have lunch or dinner for $1.20. Yeah. So if you're going to charge me a dollar twenty to deliver, I, like I don't, I don't get why. And because I'm probably not going to get delivered that often, you don't learn enough about me. Like all you get is my address and my credit card number. Hmm. But I think the difference is that when you do the laundry or the online shopping or the food delivery, I'm going to order food every week, right? Almost like clockwork, right? And you can upsell things to me. You know, you want the broccoli this week or do you want the organic carrots? I'll take in the carrots kind of thing. Like that makes sense to me. But it's, I think it's really hard to upsell somebody on, you know, like when you go to McDonald's, it's like, do you want the Happy Meal? Right. I've exactly. already decided I want the, I don't want a large Coke. I want the small Coke kind of thing. So I don't know if that model itself lends itself really nicely to, the upselling and just mm. buying the data. And I think that it's more likely. Now, maybe again, this fits into, we talked last week a little bit about, maybe it fits into the suite of things. So you run a laundry business that has delivery. You run a supermarket business that has delivery. And maybe as an add-on, you just do the food delivery for restaurants. But I just don't know that you're getting enough data in return to justify it. And I think the fact that a company like Sprig shuts down and who else, like, well, just like who else has shut down in this business, right? I mean, did we go, we went through a little bit of the list, right? There's a whole Spoon bunch of Indian Rocket And a whole, a whole bunch of Indian companies right. as yeah. well, right? Right, and we went through this a couple of weeks ago 
whether it was 10 men, I don't think they're going to be around because of the other delivery style systems that they have in India that work in a way that's like <laughs> insane. It's almost like yeah, aliens are doing box. it. Yeah. yeah, the Tiffin box is like, and I think it's funny that the Tiffin is now being competed by these guys, Tin Men. It kind of rhymes, but doesn't really rhyme. Right. And then we looked at the Penang business. Now, I didn't realize this when we were talking about that business in Penang, but Penang is actually the second largest um urban area in Malaysia and in mm. the second largest province there. So sure, it's a big it's a big place. But I still just don't think that it's gonna succeed in its current format and I don't necessarily think that it's just there to get the data. But again, let's let's talk about Southeast Asia now, right? Big news. We talked last week or the week before about a couple actually it's probably a month ago now right about companies that are being funded in this space in southeast mm. asia that are based on models right that we saw in the united states right so let's yeah. talk a little bit i want to start small and then we can talk big about alibaba and what's going on yeah, in china yeah, let's do it. right but you have 15 companies in hong kong that do that do meal delivery now hong kong's not a big place not a big population and again it's hard to do delivery there because it's you know this right very hilly mm. The roads are insane. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, you know, you come around these curves in Hong Kong and, like, everyone's going to die kind of thing. <laughs> but people want to eat healthy, so they're starting to do this kind of healthy meal style thing. But I believe that this is a lifestyle business, not a fundable business. Mm. Right? And I kind of see the same thing. I'm starting to believe the same thing in Southeast Asia. Now, the, the population in Southeast Asia is a lot bigger, but it also means they're more spread out. And so I always thought that these things like Sprig with the custom kitchens would work. You build a kitchen in a neighborhood, and then you deliver just to that neighborhood. No one's done this yet. right? I think one of the Sprig ideas was that they'd get the food almost hot, and then they heat it up in the car. If not, if it wasn't Sprig, it was some other company that was doing that. But again, in Hong Kong, you've got 15 companies competing. Here's the other problem with this business is that the barriers to entry are so low. And that the tech is really off the shelf, right? So you can say, well, we've got a, an automated tracking system for all of our drivers. I can buy that hmm. easily, right? All our drivers carry a phone with a GPS. Well, maybe four years ago that made a big difference, but today everyone has a GPS on their phone. It doesn't really matter. Like none of the things about these businesses are defensible. Hmm. And again, you run into a massive logistics problem. So I'm just not, I'm just not that bullish on it. And I don't think in a few weeks we're going to get to a conversation like we had about the laundry delivery and about the supermarket delivery where there's so much data that gets um, learned here or that gets collected here that it makes sense for people to do this even if they're going to lose money on that. I mean, right. do, you, do, you do you have a view on this? or? Well, I was just going to ask, before, looking at, whilst you were talking about the Hong Kong delivery services, just before we get to the data, I mean, you were talking about barriers to entry being so low looking at the delivery services in Hong Kong, you know, they're super niche, aren't they? Yeah, super. Uh, like, you know, there's, there's a delivery service for paleo specific diets. And then you've got somebody, I mean, these guys, Bionaquantics, who are delivering specifically for your own <laughs> genotype. You know, they're so <laughs> niche. I wonder how many people in Hong Kong specifically need that kind of service. I mean, what's that indicative of? Is it indicative of very low barriers to entry? So the only way people can sort of protect their turf is to go super niche? Or do you think it's kind of a bit of kite flying? What do you think is going on there? I think it's a little bit of both. But I do believe in the end that it's just going to be a really niche business, right? And it's funny you mentioned the paleo. There's a business in Thailand that's called Paleo Rabi. And I actually think this is a really fabulous business, right? The whole idea around the paleo diet, mm. right, is that, you know, the human digestive system hasn't really changed since we used to live in a cave. So we should really just continue to eat as healthy as people did back then, yeah. right? In other words, just eat the carrot. There's no reason to put sauce. I, I'm guessing, right? I'm not a big paleo guy, so I don't really know. But, but and as, a great, as great a business as that is, it doesn't scale. But it just doesn't scale, right? So, like, do you hear anybody today talk about the Atkins diet? Yeah, exactly. But you know what it is, right? You've yeah. heard about it. You know, when we were, you know, 25 years it ago, people it, used right? to talk about it all. That was it. Yeah. But it's gone. And even if it's not gone, nobody cares about it. And I think paleo is going to be one of those things that's like that. And even if it does continue, it's going to continue on a scale that's niche, like you said. If you look at all these businesses in Hong Kong, 
right? There's nutrition kitchen. There's all these little businesses. So there are multiple problems here. If it's if there are 15 of them, it's got to be really easy to start. But also, if it's 15 of them, who's going to win? Hmm. Like, let's say you are an investor. How do you know? Do you invest in all 15 of them? Right. If you look at these logistics companies in the United States or even in Southeast Asia, you kind of have a choice between two or three companies. And if you want to take a portfolio view from an investment standpoint, right, you can invest in Grab, you can invest in Lyft, and you can invest in Uber. Little bits and pieces. Mm-hmm. One of them is going to win. And because there are so few of them, you can actually take the portfolio view. I'm investing in the sector. right? In a, in a way, it's almost like investing in a listed security. I'm going to invest in Toyota, Honda, Mazda, and probably not Isuzu, right? And Nissan, because those are the four biggest companies. And at any one point in time, some of them's going to have one of them's going to have a hit car, one of them's not. Mm. I don't know which one, so I'm just going to buy the sector. People do this all the time. I've seen this for you know for decades in the listed securities business. But if there are 15 companies just in Hong Kong, how do you know who's going to win? I don't think you do. So from an investment standpoint, it's not great. But like you said, I can't even remember the name of that company we were talking about, Bio, Quanto, something, right? I just, don't think, it's, I just, I just don't think it's... Yes. Bio or Quantix, that's it, right? Right. So this is specifically for your genome. Gen- or, genotype, right? I mean, Genotype. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But there's a lot of this. Is, I mean, there's a lot of that going on in Hong Kong, real specific diet requirements. And also... I think that you know, rather than, you know, rather than just delivering food on a sporadic basis, what they're trying to do, and maybe this is kind of like where they're trying to make up for a lack of demand, is they're trying to, you know, they're trying to turn it into a subscription service, right? So you get a meal a day, you know, whether that's a paleo meal every day or you get a, a Quantix meal for your genotype every day or whatever, right? That seems to be the way they're going, right? <laughs> <laughs> but do people want I'm that? Sorry. I mean, that seems to be, you know, it's kind of one of those things that may sound great, but it ends up being a real chore at the end of the day. I don't know. I mean, it'd be interesting I think to you're, experience. I think you're right. 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 So food food is one of those things, right? It's a, it's kind of a double-edged sword, right? It's like, I want to eat really healthy, but could you imagine this? You go on a date, right? You meet somebody, you really want to take them out. You want to impress them. You take them to a restaurant. That's like a normal date, Right. And can you imagine sitting down with someone and having them say, I, I cannot have the penne because it doesn't match my genotype. Yeah. <laughs> no, but seriously, just imagine. Exactly. I like to think of things in the context of dating because dating is something that everybody does or everybody wants to do. Right. And that would be weird. Like you would just sit down and someone would say, I'm sorry, I would love to have this, but that wine doesn't match my genotype. So I can't have it. Like, it's just so weird. Yeah. I, I don't know, and I just don't see that working as a as a methodology for um, for buying food, and I don't think it's something that's going to last. But like you said, from a business model perspective, right? Pete, they want to turn this into a subscription thing. So like Blue Apron does this in the United States, hmm. very well funded again, and super highly advertised. Every podcast that I listen to in the U.S. has an ad for Blue Apron, but again. You have to order like two meals a week or four meals a week for three people or two people, whatever it is. And I'm sure I've said this before. But even if you're like married and you're settled down, you've got a permanent partner, whatever it is, it's Tuesday night and your Blue Apron meal is coming. Two problems for me with this model, at least. One is you still got to cook those meals. Mm. Right, so it's supposed to be like the family that cooks together, crooks together. I don't know what rhymes with cook, so I'm not sure it's a great thing. <laughs> um, but what if you know your buddy just shows up in town that night hmm. and says, "Hey, Lisa and I are going out to dinner tonight. Do you want to go out with us?" And you like you call your wife and you say, "Hey, let's go out to because I haven't been in, you know, in Tokyo in years. Let's go out to dinner with them." What happens to your Blue Apron meal? Like that kind of subscription thing is great, I think, for razors right and for dog food and for toilet paper but i don't think it's great for either prepared or unprepared meals because food is like a social thing Mm -hmm. and the kind of people who are buying these kind of foods are also likely to eat out right and imagine the kind of consumers they're targeting have dispensable income right so they're going to go and eat out i was just going to say the same thing 
right? They're going to have enough income so that they can afford a service like this. And if they do, they're very likely on the way home to just go like this. You know what? I haven't had king crab in a while. Exactly. Let's go out to dinner tonight. Or somebody shows up from work and they extend their business trip an extra day. And they're taking everybody out to dinner and you have to go. And I can just see, like I think we talked about this before, but this conversation makes perfect sense to me. It seems hey, honey, the thing I got to go out tonight. Sorry, go ahead. I interrupted. No, 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 no. You go for it. You, you got to do your bit. Do your monologue. But it's like, but it's like, hey, honey, I, you know, I want to. I, I know we have that blue apron thing coming tonight, and you can just see her on the other side. But, but what, right? It's like, but you know, Bill's in town from San Francisco, and I got to go out to dinner because the whole team's gone. And it's like, well, what am I going to do with the other half of this thing? So it creates stress too. Exactly. And, that, and it's one, nobody's that one instance of stress or the one wasted meal just kind of blows the whole thing out of the water, right? If you're trying to do it to save money or trying to do it to, you know, for more lifestyle convenience, it kind of all backfires, right? Yeah, I just don't think it's going to work. So that, that side of the delivery business I don't think works either. And again, even if it does, maybe it just works in Hong Kong or maybe it just works – you know, but it doesn't scale. All these businesses that are supposed to get funded are supposed to scale. Anyway, I interrupted you. <laughs> I was going to say, I mean, into my mall and long, but. yeah, no, I mean, whichever angle you take and look at food delivery, it just seems that, you know, however you look at it, it doesn't stack up. Right? I don't understand. I mean, looking at it, and this is the second time we've come back and looked at food delivery as a core subject for a show. It's a, where, where are the opportunities here? I just don't get it. When you look at it, it either seems to be well, there's not enough margins in food delivery, so people are scrampling around, you know, scrimping and trying to scrounge around for margins that don't exist, like taking tips from the drivers or secret charges, you know, like markups, twenty percent on the the menu. Or they're trying to look at automation, but you know that's years away. Or they're trying to do very niche or you know subscription based models, which are aimed at a specific market. And as we said, that could easily be blown out of the water by simple lifestyle changes right which happen right so where right. is the angle here i don't know and and here's where it gets really interesting alibaba through ant financial right according to a publication in asia is in talks to lead a round of a billion dollars and i know china's big and sure if everybody yeah. buys toilet paper in china everyone's going to be a billionaire you know, we've been saying this for 25 years, but they let a billion dollar, they're going to lead a billion dollar investment round into a company called ELE.me. It's one of China's leading food delivery startups. Now, Bloomberg is reporting this. It's not confirmed yet, but if it's, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire, right? Mm. It's going to value this company at five and a half to six billion dollars. And they're battling against somebody else, another company that's a merged entity, right? Now, no one wants to comment on whether this is true or not, but here's a merged entity again, right? So why was there a merger? Because way back in 2015, when there was a massive bubble in food delivery in China, these two companies decided that the daily deal service, right? They decided they were going to merge into one entity and they were doing what to get customers? Like, what were they doing? The typical burning cash, hmm. right? And when I, I don't want to keep going back to the same thing, but again, it just reminds me of that Saturday Night Live skit back in the 70s. You know, <laughs> you give us a $20 bill, we'll give you two tens. You know, you, you <laughs> give us a dollar, we'll give you nine dimes and two nickels. How do you make money? Exactly. Right? Volume. Right. And everything in China has become like a proxy war between Alibaba and Tencent because Tencent is funding this other business. I think in the end, this is going to end in tears because, as you said, I don't, I don't see the business model yet unless it's a bolt on to another type of delivery business, right? It's like, we'll do all of your logistics, including right. your food delivery. But in this case, where you're valuing a company itself at $5 billion, and that company just does food delivery, right? I mean, it's considered one of China's leading food delivery startup businesses. I just think this is going to end in tears. How does right? that sort of stack up with Alibaba's history? I mean, they're not cavalier with their investments, are they? And they seem to have a pretty good attitude towards what they do, and they seem to get into the right industries at the right time. How does that matter? And when you sort of see this investment, do you think that's kind of out of character with them? Or do you, why do you think it's happening? Well, I think this is maybe their fire phone moment, right? In other words, you know, Amazon spent a ton of time saying we need to get everybody onto a phone that we own, right? right. So they forked Android to get onto this big platform. They had a massive 
um, announcement for this business. And in the end, like Amazon doesn't always get it right. The same way Alibaba doesn't always get it right and Tencent doesn't always get it right. Now, in Amazon's case, it was a hardware business. They learned, right? So they moved all the stuff that they learned from building the Fire Phone. They tried tablets as well. And they said, wait a second. You know, all the research that we've done has said that people want to move into voice and then they built Alexa, right? So that Alexa business now, we don't know how many they sell, but nominally it's supposed to be quite successful. Now, is this a test of just how can we deliver the most difficult thing with the smallest margins? Mm. That could be true, right? And Alibaba does have a lot of cash and they have a monopoly basically or a duopoly in almost all cases with Tencent in China. You know, again, you can go back to a massive market. Everyone's getting richer faster. But it's hard to believe that they're doing this because it's a test into some other market or that they just believe that this is a way to build a great delivery business and then use it for everything else they're doing. But I don't generally count out these really big and really successful companies. But I'll say this as well. They're not always right. Hmm. Right, they're not always right. So I don't, and again, we'll learn along with the rest of the market, right? But this investment into this company was kind of mentioned in passing, mm. but I'm not sure what the value add is to them, except maybe just to own every vertical and every logistics vertical in China. But I really just don't believe that anybody has figured out yet how to do food delivery and have it make sense. Now, to be fair, you know, we're not perfect, right? We don't always have the right idea, and we can always learn from at least the discussions that we have about what you know what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. Um, you know, Alibaba came in and bought Lazada, what is it now, six months, eight months ago, right? And I think it's going to be really interesting to watch what they do with that as well. I'm only bringing it up because you mentioned, like, is this, like, what does this mean in the context of the rest of the investments that they made? So I believe that they're going to take this solid, that this Lazada investment and just try to change the whole methodology that Lazada was using, you know, increase revenue. They bought it at a lower valuation number. So it, this may turn out well, but I just think this food thing, I just don't think it's going to work. Mm. So I'm happy to be argued with about this, right? And again, if you go back and look at statistics, who, who published these stats? I'm just trying to think of your monitor, right? And this was a year ago. You know, they say that home delivery in Asia is like one of the biggest markets in the world, Asia Pacific, China completely dominates home delivery. That was a year and a half ago now, right? India was second. But there are massive populations in both of these markets, and maybe someone will figure out how to make those unit economics work. Hmm. But I think um, on the whole, like a country like Vietnam, where food is really cheap, Thailand as well, Singapore is slightly different, but again, small population. Indonesia is huge, but again, food's really cheap there. In India, I think this Tiffin thing is just... Maybe the people that run that business will automate it, and then that's how they're right. going to handle this thing. Yeah, because those guys must make money. They've been doing this business for generations. Like a reverse engineer of the whole model. Of the whole model, if awesome, they do that right? from a technology standpoint. I, I would invest in that at some level, right? Because oh, yeah. we know it already works. But, you know, I, I think the, um, you know, all bets are off on China right. figuring out this model, but I think it's definitely worth watching for sure. Do you think it could be like... Uh, I mean, Amazon bought Zappos for a billion in cash, more or less, didn't they? Cash and stock. And they didn't buy it because they needed to dominate the shoe retail sector, right? I think they bought it, and, and Jeff Bezos has gone on record saying this. They bought it because they wanted to learn how Zappos did it did its thing. You know, Zappos had you know, an amazing, you know, when he looked at its metrics in terms of customer retention, repeat business, all these kind of metrics, customer happiness, it was doing something right. So, may, I don't know, maybe Alibaba's gone in for that reason alone, to learn, as you said, right? You know, it could learn a lot about that front-end logistics, which it couldn't learn in another business. Right. right. I mean, to a, certain, to a certain extent, right, we can look at the billion-dollar acquisition or billion-dollar investment, and we can make fun of the valuation, five to six billion dollars. But in the end, when you're generating the amount of cash that Alibaba is generating every year, right? I mean, the amount of sales they do on just like 11, 11 day, one day, I forget what they call it in China, right? It's probably 10 to $11 billion. Yeah. So in the context of the amount of money that they're generating or their cash flow, investing a billion dollars in a business like that is not such a big deal. And you're right. 
if you mirror it with what Amazon did for Zappos. And again, think about this. Amazon already runs one of the best customer service businesses in the world. We must have spoken about this, but like if you have a problem with Amazon, you just call them and they've already anticipated it. You go, hey, my name is Michael. And they're like, yeah, we know page 35 on that book wasn't working. Just send it back to us. We'll send it to you. <laughs> my cousin's so in your true. neighborhood right now to pick up that book. Don't worry about it. And he's giving you a free pizza too. You're like, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> they're so good at it. And yet, and this is a Bezos thing, right? They went out and bought Zappos to find out more about how to improve their customer service. And exactly. maybe you're right. Maybe they're maybe they're buying this on-demand food thing because they know the unit economics don't work. They know it's really difficult, and maybe they'll learn something from it. And then a billion dollars to them, Nothing. maybe it's worth learning. Right, exactly. Well worth it. That'd be fascinating. A space yeah. to watch. Yep. Yeah. I mean, like we said, you know, the whole reason for doing this is just to follow up on you know, the fact that Sprig went bankrupt. This thing is not over yet. I think people are going to keep trying. And frankly, I want someone to succeed because, again, I was talking to friends about this as I was preparing, you know, doing research on this episode. When you're sitting in your apartment and it's 9 o'clock at night and you just got home from work and you haven't had dinner yet, you want food. And you want it delivered. And you want it delivered fast. You want it delivered hot if it's hot food. And you want it delivered at a reasonable price. So it's not going to go away. The question is, how's somebody going to make money off it? Now, here's the other thing we haven't talked about. And this is, we've been in this conversation for a long time. But like Domino's is a logistics business everywhere exactly. in the world, right? And they've nailed this delivery thing. 30 minutes or less, so you get it for free. It used to be how they advertised. And if you ordered 10 pizzas from Domino's over like a three-month period of time, maybe you had a problem with half of one, statistically, right? In other words, you never, at least I never did, said, that's it, that's the last time I'm ordering from Domino's. Because hmm. it kind of showed up the way you expected it to show up. Yeah. yeah. And it was fine. But, but that means that the individual stores and the individual um, you know, franchises have figured out how to deliver for themselves. So I wonder how someone steps in the middle of that at or is, scale. is there a space, right? I mean, is, that, I mean, is it like supermarkets, right? You know, the ones who kind of worked it out in the end were... The supermarkets, right? Not these kind of middlemen like the web vans that we talked about before. But it's the people like Tesco's, for example, or in Europe, you've got people like Ocado, right? Which is a, a joint franchise, a joint venture yeah. between a couple of the supermarkets, right? So stuff like that. I mean, they, you know, whilst all the, the dot coms got into the space and try to get into home delivery, they kind of developed the market and took the risk for the supermarkets to come in later and learn from them, right? So I wonder if that's going to be yep. the same with food delivery. It's going to be McDonald's, Domino's, the big chains who dominate that space. Maybe there I'm isn't sure. a space for the small guys. I, I, I don't think so. I, you know, I was going to say Kentucky Fried Chicken, but I don't think it's called that anymore. I think it's just KFC because of chicken. But, I, I you know, again, I have this conversation about delivery with people all the time and they're willing to switch. So there's no stickiness and there's no barrier to entry, right? If you've got a motor scooter and a thing on the back of your on the back of your bike, you can disintermediate Happy Fresh. Mm. And I don't know. People tell me that they really like that service, but I ask, how do you determine which one you're going to use? And they always tell me, whoever has the best deal. Yeah, right. Right. So again, the same problem that people had with Groupon over time. It was like, I don't care who's selling me that thing as long as it's the cheapest one. So yeah, it's commodity. Yeah. Anyway. Excellent. Any surprises this week? Yeah, not not really, not in its standard format. But I did want to follow up on something. I mean, this whole this whole episode feels like a follow up on a previous thing. But I was having a conversation with somebody last week, and and I was talking about autonomous cars. You know, I'm so into this whole concept mm. and how it's going to change our lives. And I was had another conversation with somebody about like what is a normal day like in the life of an autonomous car not in the life of a person who has one and then this person so and it was a guy from israel right an israeli technologist so a guy who should know he literally turned to me you know we're standing in a group and he turned to me and he goes autonomous cars never gonna happen hmm. and i don't think he was like baiting me but it was this is was a big surprise to me i i, I wasn't even really sure that i heard him properly he was like, it's never going to happen. It's too dangerous. It's too expensive. People like to drive. Like all the arguments that, a norm, that wow. you know, normal people make and that we can disintermediate, disintermediate easily. And I started giving him my whole thing on it. And he like just looked at me like, 
no way. And it doesn't matter what you say to me. This is never going to happen. And I actually found that shocking. Yeah. Now, I think over time, we'll see. We know it's going to happen. We know it's coming. It is coming. Right? Oh, we definitely know it's coming. Do you remember the name of the company that um, – I want to find it. I, I don't want to I don't want to surmise, right? I think it's Acne. Hold on a second. I want to find this. Just work with me for a second. Which company is this? So it's the company that actually presented on – it's called Anki Drive. Yeah. Right. So Anki was a company that sort of presented their product. It was a game of autonomous driving cars. Okay, they presented it worldwide to WWDC for Apple back in 2013. Right, so why am I bringing this up? Well, because they were controlling their cars. They were toys, right? And each one of these toys had like a 5 gigahertz chip in it. Okay, and the toys were meant to like go around a track in a way it was supposed to simulate a video game, but with hardware. 80% software, 20% hardware. And they were simulating it. And I've done some research on the guy who runs the company, right? What's his name again? Boris Sofin. And he was saying, we, he was on one of the teams, actually, that used to participate. I think he's a Carnegie Mellon guy. But he was on one of the teams that used to participate in the development of autonomous cars back in the day, like back in 2005 and 2006. And he was you know, on one of these teams that tried to do the drive through the desert without dying type of thing for an autonomous car. Anyway, his point was, he was asked the question like, why didn't you go start an autonomous car company? And he was like, well, that's really hard, but we're doing it from the other end. We're mm-hmm. going to build toys first because toys don't get into accidents. Toys don't kill anybody. And all the stuff we learn exactly. from building robots and robotics that goes into that is going to help us then go out and build autonomous cars because we can completely control our environment. You know, And the question to him was, sure, but... You know, in the real world, your environment is not controllable. And he said, yeah, maybe, but we want to get this perfected in a way so that when we actually do drop it on a road in five years, we've because we can simulate a car swerving in front of you. We can simulate running a red, all this kind of stuff. It was just a really interesting take on it. But again, when I thought about that in the context of somebody telling me this is never going to happen, there's just so much money being spent on it and so many people trying to do it. And we already know from conversations we've had before that this thing is just going to happen because everybody wants it to happen. It almost has to happen. Mm. And the impact on society and life is going to be so huge that it's shocking to me. So it's a big surprise to me Um, that there are actually still people out there that think (laughs) it's not going to happen. Well, we don't know know what the defense was, but I don't get it. Uh, And by the way, those Anki robots, we have one in our house here. Do you have the Do you have the Cosmo? Cosmo, yeah, my son's got it. It's a okay, pretty, so yeah, I mean, it's a pretty you me. know, it's a pretty smart piece of software, and you know, the hardware's pretty neat as well. But you know, it's cool what they're doing. They're sort of building robots which can play and play with kids, right? So it's there. I mean, they're building it from the bottom up, and it can do some quite se- you know semi intelligent stuff, right? But you know, are you talking about autonomous cars? Well, this thing's got face recognition in it. It's got spatial recognition in it. It's got pattern recognition. It can recognize, you know, like noises and sequences and so on. You know, bottom up, start with a very basic thing. You know, they could add functionality to this thing. And, you know, there you go. You can take it from there. But I right. can't I mean, see this whole... not happening, right? Because... No, I can't see it not happening either. And his whole idea around the, the Cosmo toy was that if you take engineers from Pixar and take engineers, I can't remember the other company that he was talking about, but like companies that have built characters help him then give the Cosmo robot a personality. Mm. But what's interesting to me, and this gets back to what we were talking about earlier with the robots delivering the food, is that all of the psychologist studies that pertain to humans' interactions with robots was that they want them to be, like have a personality, be human. And and this Cosmo is the first attempt at actually making it not just move around like a human, but making it behave like a human, like you said, with pattern recognition, voice recognition, all of those things. Anyway, it's like like I was saying earlier, we can talk about that um, in more detail later, but as I was saying, like it's shocking to me that somebody thinks that this is not going to happen, because it actually already is happening. So I don't understand what the view was, but I know they're wrong. We would love to hear if people have a view on that. 
Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, they can tweet us at um, at Michael Waits, always hashtag Asia Tech Podcast. Um, and where can they reach you? Well, LinkedIn, my links on any Asia Tech Podcast show. Connect with me on LinkedIn. Yeah. Easiest way. I'm not a and big subscribe. Twitter fan, so I'll leave that to I you am. Guys. I'm all over Twitter and You're subscribe. All um, I'm all over Twitter and subscribe on you on iTunes. iTunes, yeah. yeah. I think it's that way iTunes actually is really important to us, and the reason why is because if you give us a rating and subscribe on our, on iTunes, it helps other people find us as well. And the better ratings you give us, the more people listen, and the more people that listen, the better we can um, serve you. So please go and download it on iTunes and give us a rating. You've been listening to Asia Tech Podcast. Find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com.